Hello there, welcome everyone. Hopefully you can hear me now. Uh, my name's Paul Hayes. I'm uh, the head of uh, our modern workplace practice at Cooper Parry IT. Thanks so much for joining us on the event today. Uh, it's really great to have you. Hopefully today you'll, you'll learn a lot about the Power Platform and what, what the capabilities are and really give um, and really set your minds thinking about what you know what you could use the Power Platform in future for uh, to really support and help your business. So our, uh, our, our focus as a business at Scuba Parry IT, uh, particularly on the modern workplace side, um, is, is all around digital culture and, and, we're, and, and powered by Microsoft 365 in the background, but really focusing on how those digital tools can help uh, our culture and our business and really support um, the growth and optimization of, of what we do. So uh, particularly going through COVID-19 and everyone working remotely, this particular app, uh, app that we're looking to build today, um, which we've just, which we've built ourselves and we're using internally, is something that we've offered out free to the, free to the market, but we've also put this event on so that, um, as I mentioned, you can learn how to, to see how, how, how things like this can benefit your business. And, and these are tools that you already have, and that's what's really important about um, what we're what we're trying to help uh, businesses uh, with at this time is that if you've got an Office 365 license or now a Microsoft 365 license, there's so much out there that can really support your business and so much in that uh, in that toolkit that can really help you um, and help you optimize and, um, and and support your business as you move forward. So um, I'll we'll click through onto the agenda slide now. And um, I'll let you read through this and you can see the running order, uh, but critical to this is the, is the link at the bottom, the zip file. If you haven't downloaded those files already, please do so as you'll need them as part of uh, th uh, this morning's session to uh, build the app yourself. So um, in terms of the running order for today, uh, we were very lucky to have uh, Chris Huntingford on board with us. He'll introduce himself shortly from Microsoft. He's a power platform guru we work very close with, closely with. He's helped us, uh, support us in building our Red Hot Teams culture apps that we um, that we also uh, work with at the moment and some of you as clients uh, will be using. Uh, Chris will uh, introduce himself in a second. We've also got Steve Strang, who, uh, who works in building and develops our, our apps internally. Again, who will introduce himself in a second. So I hope you enjoyed today. Really great to have you, as I said. Um, any questions, there'll be opportunity to ask along the way. Uh, I hope um, I hope you get uh, something from this and it really sets your minds racing in terms of what, what the Power Platform can do for your business, but we're here to support you and here to answer your questions along the way. I'll, uh, I'll hand over now to Steve to introduce himself and uh, you can see all our pictures up there now and uh, I hope you uh, enjoy the morning. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Uh, hi, everyone. So I'm Steve. I'm a technology specialist here at CPIT, which means I work with the Power Platform predominantly. So Power Apps, Power BI, Power Automate. So I've built the app you're going to be building today um, alongside Paul. As I mentioned, we're sort of giving it out to customers, but also doing this session just so you can have a look at building it yourself. So hopefully you'll learn some stuff about Power Apps today and the Power Platform in general and sort of see how you can use it. Um, so I'm going to pass over to Chris now just to introduce himself and then he's going to give you an overview of the Power Platform. Awesome. Uh, Steve, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you, mate. Awesome. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start sharing my screen while I intro. So good morning, everyone. My name is Chris Hunting Ford. Um, I'm a partner technical architect here at Microsoft. So. Yeah, basically what I get to do is work with our amazing partners to build out really, really cool solutions using the Power Platform. Now, one of the things that I've one of the things that I've discovered over the last few months is that, you know, working with folks like Cooper Perry, we get we have the opportunity to build out these really, really amazing apps. So I just want to give a shout out um, to Cooper Perry. Thank you guys very much, Paul, Mark, and Steve, for having me on this call. I really appreciate it. Um, what I've done is I've just shared up, I've just shared my slides. Uh, I just want to confirm, can you guys, oops, let's go to live. Can you guys see the uh, the slide with the, with the chap on the phone over there right now? Gents. Yeah, you can see that. 
Great. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to run this video now. The reason I'm going to run this video is because there's a chap by the name of um, Samet, and he works for a company called Heathrow Airport. And I thought a good way to a good, I thought a good way to kick this off was be, would be just to show you a little bit about Samet's story. Hopefully the audio comes through. And uh, Samet used to be a security guard at Heathrow. So you remember the chaps that used to say, "No water, no no water in your bags. Get out your laptops." Blah blah blah. He used to be that guy that used to work behind the the security booth by the um by the X-ray machines. And um, it was interesting because Sam had got hold of some of this technology and he, he thought, you know what, I've got a really, really good way. I think I've got a really good idea here. Instead of us having this 260 um, page manual that we put, that we scroll through all the time and have to read all the time, I'm going to write something. I'm going to build something to help people manage this. So I hope this audio works. I'm going to fire this up. If um, somebody could confirm that the audio is fine, that would be great. So there we go. I don't just want to make a living. Yeah, I can hear it. I want to make a difference. When I left school at 16, my dad was working in Heathrow at the time, and this opportunity came up as becoming a security officer. I thought, what a great opportunity, you know. You know, my dad used to take me here to watch sea planes and everything. So why not work for a company or an airport like Heathrow? So I've been a security officer for 13 years. When I saw the amount of paper and time we were spending, I saw an app would be a great solution for these problems to be solved. About a year ago, I started learning about the Microsoft programs. I went home and I looked at a blog from Power Apps and it said, this is how you can build an app. And I thought, why did no one know this? Because this could have so much potential to change so many things. We have saved 11,000 sheets of paper and saved around 288 hours of manual input data going from paper to digital has been amazing. It doesn't matter what your skill levels are like, anybody can build this app. Him with his community of super users have created 17 power apps that are already being used across our airport. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. My name is Samet Saini and I'm a IT user adoption specialist at Heathrow. There's no limit what you can create with new technology. I'll create a new career. All right, so uh, it wouldn't be a, a tear-jerking Microsoft presentation without a tear-jerking uh, little movie. So we'll do the Oprah Winfrey thing. And folks, if you check under your seats, there's some tissues. Dab your eyes and uh, let's do this thing. So Steve, uh, Paul, Mark, please feel free to interject as well if you'd like to. And if, also if slides don't work or things uh, or you can't hear me, please just shout out and we'll, I'll make sure that it, that all happens on my end. So I want to talk to you guys a little bit about a couple of things before we start going into the tech. And uh, there's a number of things that have been glaringly obvious to me over the last few years um, around technology, especially things like software as a service. So one of the things I learned, right, so I'm, I'm a pretty old school chap. I mean, you know, I might be 36, but I've been working in IT for nearly 20 years, which is crazy. But um, one of the things that, I've, that I discovered really early on in my career is that data is really important and getting data is really important. And the number of organizations with more than 100 terabytes of unstructured data have more than doubled since 2016. You know, I remember, I'm, I'm pretty sure some of you have been to those um, those amazing Microsoft presentations. I know my colleagues on the poll from Cooper Perry have, and um, they'll, they'll, they used to fling up slides and they used to say, big data. And everyone was like, oh, big data. And that was the thing that we all spoke about. But here's something crazy. Only 32% of those organizations actually have succeeded in analyzing that data and making it actionable. So that scares me a little bit because, uh, first of all, these are not made up stats. You know, they say that 16.87% of stats are made apart. That's not the case in this scenario. If you look at the bottom, they're actually de derived from Forrester, Gartner, and all sorts of other very interesting, uh, very interesting stat providers which makes me worry slightly because if only 32% of the companies that, are, that have my data are actually analyzing it properly, only one in three of my prov providers really know who I am as a customer. Okay, so that's cool. Let's think about my bank, my insurer, and um, I don't know, my mobile phone provider, my mobile phone contract provider. That means that only one of them really get who I am based on the fact that they have my information. The other thing that worries me is that that's cool, but if you think about the solutions they have internally, what actually are they doing with that data? What are they doing? How are they interacting 
excuse me, how they're interacting with it. Okay, so so I'm going to let that let that sit there, right? So let's put that on boiler number one on the stove. Boiler number two. We are now talking about the concept of mobility and remote working. So this slide says over 72% of the US workforce will be mobile workers by 2020. Uh, this is quite crazy. So I am kind of laughing a little bit about this because in the UK just alone, we're probably way, way, way further than that. I mean, when we were allowed to travel, some of you are actually on your mobile phones like right now, you know, so that would basically mean that we're all mobile. That's something. I mean, look at the situation we're in right now. Paul mentioned that you know, we're in a tough time. We're having a tough time with COVID. We're forced to work remotely. It's what's happening. OK, so fine. We know that the solutions that we build need to be made available cross platform and via mobile. Epic, right? Now, the time spent on your mobile device is significantly higher than any other time in the world that we've ever had before. Now, yeah, sure. You know, you would argue that maybe back in Nam we didn't have mobile devices. But uh, you know what? Right now, it's basically people are glued to them. This is the mobile. Your mobile device is your primary source of information, not your laptop. OK, and as much as I'd like to say it, not my wife. She may think she knows everything, but she doesn't. So that's great. Let me tell you guys a quick story. I remember back in Nam. So this is uh, 2011 in South Africa. By the way, I'm not sorry about the rugby. Woo -hoo. So 2011, I remember standing in front of an audience of roughly a thousand people in this crazy auditorium. And uh, Microsoft had just released their mobile phone operating system. I don't know whether this was career limiting or career boosting, but we'll get there, right? So they gave me, they gave me, they said, hey, Chris, we do you want to help us launch Windows Phone? And I said, well, hell yeah, you know, why not? That sounds like a really good idea. So they gave me this HTC and they said, cool, what you've got to do is you've got to demo uh, Dynamic CRM 2011 in front of all these people. So I said, yeah, cool, no problem. That's what I'll do. So I had my laptop, really, really thick Dell laptop, and it had two VMs, virtual machines on it. By the way, this is South Africa, right? When you guys had um, online solutions, we were still like dialing in with modems back then and using carrier pigeons and smoke signals and things to, commu to communicate. So I had this VM and I remember I had a thing called internet facing deployments and I had another thing called ADFS where I was federating. And um, I remember praying to the demo gods that this information, when I captured it on my phone, would synchronize with my laptop. And I had this horrible camera over my hand. You never want to be in that position. Never. If you're a nail biter, that's not where you want to be. And I, I remember clicking the save button and nothing happened. And you know what's crazy? We take that for granted right now. We take the fact that data is moving across these different devices so quickly and so seamlessly right now. I mean, even look at the communication we're having at the moment across Microsoft Teams. We don't think about what's actually happening in the airwaves or across the pipes. We just assume that it's going to happen. And actually, our customers, from a Microsoft perspective, we know that you guys need to have this functionality. We know that you need to be able to work remotely. So we're building it into our applications like the Power Platform. The other thing, and you know, you know, Steve, Steve made it, Steve showed me something really interesting yesterday, and I'll bake this into my story. So building apps can be expensive. Now, you go talk to an organization and you say, hey, you know, um, what are you guys doing from an application perspective? And they say, oh, we're building an app to do this, an app to do that, and it's costing us hundreds of thousands. And I always kind of go back and I'm like, well, why does that cost so much? And they're like, oh, because we need to pay like millions of custom developers. We need to pay, you know, Jeff to sit in the dark room, drink Pepsi, grow moss and write tons of code and use React and Xamarin, which are great products, by the way. And um, that that's a good point to make because Steve yesterday, you know, we were chatting about it and I'm like, hey, man, he's like, how long did it take you to build this app? And I said, oh, you know, a couple of hours. Like for me, that wasn't too bad. He wrote out a really good set of instructions and I checked them out. I did some of my own stuff. Which, which is what you're going to be doing today, by the way. And, you know, it just dawned on me while I was building that app that actually I did that really quickly. I'm saying a couple of hours, like I'm taking two hours out of my day to stick an app together, like it's a train smash, where before this would take you months. So the ability to build applications quickly has gotten really, really sort of upfront with us. And we call that low code, no code developments. So those of you that are developers, don't worry, there is space for you. But for us, uh, as non-coders, by the way, I am. I used to be a dev and work for Borland, but I'm better now. Um, those those devs, you have space to work within this platform as well. So a couple of other things I want to talk to you about. Also, back in Nam, again, I'm telling you all my war stories. It's quite, kind of weird. Back in Nam, I used to be an IT admin. So I used to work for a courier company uh, in South Africa, and they were they, it was countrywide. So I was the IT admin for the country, and I remember people coming up to me and saying, "Hey, Chris." 
we need a solution to do this, or can you run a network cable here? And that was like my worst thing in the world. And I remember saying to them, yeah, you know, no problem. So I would either build something using Delphi or like, you know, slap something on top of an interbase database we had or download something. But when I said we couldn't do it because their, their processes were too complex, you know what they did? They went onto the internet and they downloaded weird stuff. And I'm like, wow, what weird stuff? And you guys are thinking, wait, what? And don't worry, I'm not talking about that weird stuff. I'm talking about shadow IT. So they would get on the net, download these weird apps like Zoho CRM, and they would use that in the background. And then when people would ask them for reports, they would give them these reports. And then the, the business would say, the, the business would say, but these these figures don't look correct. Where are you getting this information from? And uh, the, you know the, the, that department would say, look, we're getting this information from this weird system we downloaded. We'll call it System G, and System G is giving us all this information. And that's a problem, right? Because that creates lack of tracker tracking and measurements of performance. So, and in actual fact, the generation of these applications, the downloading of these, these, these kind of secret, top secret applications, and then giving data that's incorrect is actually hurting the business. So with the Power Platform, we have a saying, right? The saying in the Power Platform is, better a governed free market you know than a black market you don't know. So I'm gonna say it again, better a governed free market you know than a black market you don't know. So what I mean by that is, why not give your users or the people in your organization, whether if you're an IT admin on the call or if you're a business user, go and harass your IT staff and say, listen, we wanna do this. You have, you know, Paul made a good point. This stuff exists in your organization already. So you can use it, build out and actually not harm the business and not harm IT. Because IT stick up what we call digital guardrails. There's governance in this whole thing. So don't worry. Power Apps and the Power Platform doesn't magically give you access to data you, you shouldn't have access to. What it allows you to do is build out solutions really quickly that will help bolster your performance and actually work well with an organization. So as an example, um, I worked with the Housing Association some time back and uh, they wanted an antisocial behavior management solution. Now what that is, is like, say for example, you all live in a house, right? If you live in a boat, this could get weird. And um, your neighbor's making a huge noise and you call up the council, the local housing association, you're like, ah, or the police department, you're like, ah, oh, Jeff next door is making a noise. I don't know why I'm using Jeff today. It's such a, Jeff seems to be in my bad book. So if anyone on this call is called Jeff, I'm sorry. And um, you know what happens? They log a thing called an ASB case or ASBO, right? Or if you've got one of those crazy hoodie kids running around spray painting the walls or spray painting things in the road, they log an ASBO. Now, they needed somebody to be able to go out and take their mobile phone and actually log that ASBO um, physically to say this is where the actual work is and this is where the issue is and actually get people out there to go and fix it. So an application was built and given to them. The app was built in less than a day. It was given to them and they actually productionized that app. Okay, so the data source they were using initially was a SharePoint data source. What they quickly discovered was that they needed to move to another data source that was more relational. So they switched that out to SQL, which is fine. And um, at a later point, they moved it out to a thing called the Common Data Service, which we'll talk a little bit about later. But very importantly, what this does is gives people the ability to build out solutions that are relevant to them. You know what, folks? If you're if you're if you're a customer on the call and you're using um, and and you're a part of a department that has an issue, you know what's awesome? You are the person closest to the problem. You understand the problem in more depth than anyone in the world. And you know what's even cooler? You can build out a lot of these solutions. But you might need the help from somebody like Cooper Perry to help you on the governance side and the real productionizing of these applications. Finally, the other thing, and just to get off the back of what Paul spoke to you guys about, is that most of you actually have this in your organization already. So within Office 365, you get a thing called Power Apps, you get a thing called Power Automates, and you can use a lot of that to actually you know, manage the way your solutions are built. And we'll talk about what those are shortly. But the reason I say that it's important that you understand this in your organization. So I've worked with a lot of customers all the way from people like Rolls-Royce down to, uh, I'm going to use Jeff again, Jeff's cabin shop in the, you know, in the countryside. And there's solutions for everyone, right? You can build anything. But typically what happens is that when an organization is looking to solve a problem, they'll typically say, look, you know, we're going to use a SaaS product like Salesforce or Dynamics, and that solves the problem. But a lot of the time there isn't an app for that. So when there isn't an app for that, what happens? They go and get, I'm going to use a different name. We're going to go get Susan. And Susan's a custom developer. And she's super good at writing code. So what we're going to do is we're going to get Susan to build us a custom .NET solution. 
But it just so happens that Susan gets a call out from Nick Fury to go fight crime on another planet. Okay. Now that's a problem because now Susan's gone and you're stuck with that technical debt. You're stuck with a lot of code that you don't understand. Okay. And that's where you need to have this concept of low code, no code. So wherever else you have issues, it's an opportunity for the power platform. By the way, looking at the slide really messes with my eyes. So I'm kind of just like staring at the wall. <laughs> but leveraging areas within the power platform are the most important thing. If you're a non-developer, we call people that do not code and are closest to the problem that are not super technical, we call them citizen developers. And today you're going to be playing a citizen developer. Now, one of the things I like to bring up quite a lot is that in an organization, you'll have the IT expert. Okay, so the people on this call, uh, the people that are presenting to you are typically IT experts. We love tech. Okay, we nerd out on tech all the time. You know, I mean, I, I can sit and chat to Steve about tech for days and it's cool because that's our stuff, right? We, we love doing it really well. But then you've also got this business expert and you've got somebody that doesn't necessarily understand technology, but deeply understands the business side of things. I'm about as commercially as astute as a school shoe. Okay. I am I'm not a business guy. I mean, you can even see by the photo in the front of this deck. Like, that's not who I am. I'm never going to claim to be it. I don't understand it. You know what I'm super good at doing, though? I'm super good at articulating business problems into technology, though. Without boasting, that's one of the things I like to do. I'm a problem solver. And most of the people on this call from Cooper Perry are problem solvers as well. Business people don't necessarily want to do the tech, but they want to be able to translate that into technical jargon. So what happens is when you munch those two together, you get this concept of this low code empowerment platform. OK, and this low code empowerment platform really, really gets people, gives people the ability to build their awesome ideas into applications using uh, a platform that is not really focused on physically writing lines of code. Now you're going, wow, oh, Chris, that sounds too good to be true. Well, well, yeah, it is actually it is really too good to be true. When you get your grubby little paws on it, you'll understand that it is awesome. You can build out anything you'd like. Um, I've seen people build out musical instruments into apps using this platform. I've also seen people solve complex business problems using this platform as well. But the great thing, uh, the great thing is, is that you can you can use an ideation exercise and turn those ideas into apps. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to take an idea that the chaps from Cooper Perry had, and we're going to kind of bring that to life using an application. And by the way, it's a very pretty application. So a couple of other things you need to know about the Power Platform, right? We've got this chap in our business. Uh, he's kind of a big deal. Uh, his name's Sacha. He's he's our CEO, right? And again, you know, it wouldn't be a Microsoft presentation if we weren't whipping out pictures of Sacha. Now, this guy is, a, I'd like to think he's quite an educated chap. Right. I mean, he's only this year, the world's largest tech firm. And you know what Sacha said to us? He said 500 million new apps will be built in the next five years. 500 million new apps will be built in the next five years. That is bonkers. That is that's more than the apps built in the last 40 years. Now, here's the kicker of those 500 million apps. OK, so now. Let's say, let's say every single person on this call decides that they're going to build an app a minute for the next year. We're not even close. We, we're still, we're missing, the, we're missing the mark completely. We need, to, we need to get to these 500 million, right? Well, that's where we're going to be. 65% of the application developments is going to be done using low code, no code, which is very exciting, right? Now, that's great for us because from that perspective, we, we can leverage tools like the Power Platform to build out these solutions. So, couple of other things that are really key. Every single time somebody puts up one of these slides, you never put it up if you're not top right. <laughs> so yeah, the Power Platform is one of the one of the leading Microsoft technologies that we've got at the moment. It is absolutely fantastic. We'll be going through it real quick. But one of the things that's quite important here is that at the moment, we're looking at roughly 3 million monthly active developers on our platform. Now, once as I said to you before, a developer is not somebody that hides in a dark room, drinking Pepsi, growing moss, writing lines of C-sharp. Nope. A developer is somebody that creates something. So congratulations, everyone on the call. You are all now citizen developers or actual pro developers. Um, what's really cool about this is that you've got the ability now to create things. And I've always created the Power Platform a bit to Lego. You know, with when I think of Lego, right, I always think that, you know, you always start from the bottom and work your way up. You've got your green base and you put your bricks on and then you build out this really cool thing. 
you know, when you buy a SaaS product, SaaS products, software as a service products are already like the pre-built solution, right? So it's the pre-built Fairy Princess Castle or the pre-built spaceship, okay? But at the Power Platform, we give you the bricks and we encourage you to build whatever you'd like. So use your imagination. And that's why our developer base is growing so much. It's because people are just thinking out the box and building cool stuff. And that's the exciting part. The other thing that's really important is we make this real, right? So we have a lot of really awesome customers. If those of you that have been to Heathrow before, you've probably encountered a power app at some point without even knowing it. Uh, one of my favorite and most interesting stories is Arriva. So Arriva is a, there's a chap there called Keith Watling. He's actually a very good friend of mine. It happens to be his birthday today. Um, he used to be a bus driver and Keith, I'm going to use a Kelvin and Hobbs term right now. Keith transmogrified his career by building applications and he now works for a Microsoft partner leading up their digital transformation for Power Platform, which is absolutely amazing. And uh, he took the platform and built out solutions that he really needed. So you keep on saying, well, Chris, you know, let's think, right? I keep on saying, I keep on talking about these low code citizen devs versus pro devs. As I said to you before, there is space in this for everyone. Everyone has an opportunity to do something cool. You know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a creator, I'm a builder. I love to build things. And um, one of my favorite things is when I'm, is when I build things, it's, I, I want to see the end products. I'm super excited about that. And that's, that's the key thing for me. I really want to see something be, that's being created. But sometimes, you know, if I go back to the example of Lego, sometimes when I'm looking for a brick, I just can't find it. I want to be able to make it. Now, I don't need, I don't make the Lego bricks. I just use them to build cool stuff. But the example is our pro devs are good at making the Lego bricks. They're the people that kind of say, well, wow, we need, we know we need a brick that looks like this or like this. And they stick those bricks together for us and they make them so we can build cool stuff. So there's, there's a place in this for everyone. So I've gone on about amazing why this is important and the, the place of Power Platform within organizations for 20 minutes. But what is this thing? What is the Power Platform? Well, if those of you on the call are technical in any way, shape or form, you'll probably know some of these, right? Now, a lot of people say, oh, the Power Platform is a brand new product and uh, you know it's only been around for a couple of years and how can we trust it? Well, that's not actually true. The name of the Power Platform has been around for a couple of years. The concept has actually been around for roughly 16 years. Uh, so here's the interesting part, right? In Microsoft, we've got this concept of different service areas, and it's quite cool because, you know, in our different service areas, we've got Azure, which is really, really about the, the, the you know, the really core technical type of stuff. Then we've got uh, this thing called business applications, which allow you to build a line of business applications for your organization. And then we've got a thing called Office 365 that lets you build out your collaborative platforms like Teams and all those types of things. And what's really fantastic is the Power Platform is the thing that brings them together. It really, really brings them together and locks them in, right? So what we did was we said to each one of those areas, you know, the Power Platform gods said, uh, okay, we want each of you to sacrifice something to the Power Platform. So we got uh, Power BI, which used to be embedded in Excel from M from Office. We got Canvas apps from Office as well, as essentially SharePoint. We got the common data service and model driven applications. And by the way, I will explain these directly from biz apps and we've got power automate as well as power virtual agents which i still think should have been power bots uh, we got that from azure right now that's all good and well so we, we kind of brought all these different areas together and they're what we call the unicorn they're, they're the they're the area that's it's the solution that weaves everything together within microsoft and that's the exciting part because we know that bringing all these different areas together means that we've got this amazing opportunity for people to build out solutions now, great, right? So what we also did was we thought about the data side of things. So going back to my initial point about how much unstructured data there is in the world, we figured out a way to be able to manage data and expose data through these different areas within um, within the Power Platform. So if you think about uh, you want to be able to manage, or manage and store your data in a SharePoint list, no problem. The Power Platform has a connector to that SharePoint list. There's a way to view and interact with that data. So you can even create applications on top of that data, which you're actually going to do today. If you want to store and manage your data in SQL, no problem. You can absolutely do that. We have a connector for SQL. Our core data storage facility within the Power Platform is a thing called the Common Data Service. Now, the reason we built this thing is because we knew 
that a lot of organizations out there don't have a cloud-based data storage facility. We knew that, you know, things like access are just not cutting the mustard. We also know that SQL can be incredibly, incredibly technical. And some people don't understand the core concepts of things like data modeling and referential integrity and indexing. So we created an easy way for them to do it. We also know that from a SharePoint perspective, SharePoint's a really good way to store flat data. We needed a way to manage full relational data. So we gave the common data service well. And actually, that's the, that's the primary connector for the, the Power Platform. And then finally, we've got an AI builder. AI builder is the thing that uses elements of the Power Platform. And I will talk a little bit about that later. But if you break into each area, essentially the first level is what we call Power Apps. Power Apps is essentially the application layer that lives on top of data. So it's the way that you interact with data. I always, always say to people, um, can you imagine can you imagine if um, you know you had a call center and people were interacting in that call center and you had people calling in and people don't go and capture their data directly within the the common within the SQL database? They'll capture it through the application layer, which is really important. So that's the thing. That's the reason we built this app layer so that people can actually interact with data without breaking the data source. Now there are two different. Well, there are actually three different types of power apps. I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail, but you've got a thing called a model-driven app, which relies on a data model, which is built on top of the common data service. You've got a thing called a portal, which allows external people to access that data within the common data service. And then finally, you've got a thing called a canvas app, which is what you're going to be building. So if you've ever done, you can see it in the picture here, if you've done any work with Excel or PowerPoint, you'll be able to use the canvas to build out your applications. And that's quite exciting. You can make the user interface look whichever way it want, you would like. You can add pictures. You can really make it great. So I've, I've equated this experience to using Excel and PowerPoint. It's kind of like Excel and PowerPoint had a love child, right? The next part of the platform is a thing called Power Automate. So yeah, you know, it kind of feels like in Microsoft, we just chuck power in front of a word and then make it a product like PowerPoint. Surprised Word didn't get Power Word. But um. Actually, what's really cool is that with Power Automate, what you can do is you can automate the interactions you have with different products. So think about it like um, if you're doing mundane tasks with various products, you can automate them using a thing called Power Automate Flows. We've also got something really, really cool within Power Automate called RPA, Robotic Process Automation, which lets you also automate those mundane tasks, but, but um, directly against data sources that you wouldn't normally um, get data from. Okay, so Power Automate really automates the. I love the keep chucking out the word automate. Really automates those interactions even between different solutions, which is really fantastic. So if you get anything that's really really mundane and you want to automate, Power Automate's your option. The most popular part of our platform at the moment is a thing called Power BI. Power BI is really a great way to show data to people. So what we found uh, what we found quite often is that when organizations need to get a quick win and they need to really understand what's going on with their data, Power BI is the best way to do it. So what they'll typically do is that um, they will generate a report, a Power BI report, they will connect it to a data source. And you can connect to loads of things. There's 352 of them right now, actually. So if you've got Salesforce, cool, you can connect to Salesforce. If you've got Oracle, cool, you can connect to an Oracle. If you've got Dynamics, cool, you can connect to Dynamics. If you've got some weird system in the background called System A, no problem, you can even connect to that if you'd like to using what we call a custom connector. So there's way, really great ways of kind of connecting up data. What I say is Power BI breeds life into data, okay? So when you're building out your solution, Power BI really gives you a great way of visualizing what's going on in your organization. And that's what I was talking about before when I referred to lack of analytics. Power BI really provides that, that ability to kind of gain insight into what's actually going on in your organization. The tough one, which, um, people tend to struggle slightly a little bit with is what we call the common data service. I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail, but as I said before, the common data service just gives you a really great cloud-based data storage facility. And like I said, if you don't understand the technical components, don't worry. The, the common data service is a really great way to start modeling and building out data in a way that's easily, um, easily sort of absorbed and built on top of. So as an example, if you've got um, a bunch of accounts and a bunch of contacts and a bunch of vehicles, you can associate them all using relationships and actually be able to audit and manage everything within there. 
Uh, also, there's security layers that go on top of it. So you can have security all the way down to what we call row and field level, where you can obfuscate data based on a field, based on a user's role. So the example I give is that I'm in, uh, I'll use the Housing Association as an example. If you've got a vulnerable person in your in your database and you've got, they've got some data that shouldn't be shared, you can actually hide certain fields from people and even audit page reads from the database. So you can actually see who's reading what pages, which is really cool. So the last, the second last one, which is probably the most important one, actually, is the connectors. The connectors give you the ability to kind of, you know, number one, view data, but number one, build number two, build that data application that that application layer on top of the data so that people can interact. These things, this this connector database just grows and grows and grows. I remember seeing a slide um, months and a couple of years ago where we were we were boasting the fact that we had over a hundred. You know, this slide's actually incorrect. We've got over 350 and it's growing. And you know what's even better? You guys can build your own connectors and actually submit them and people can access them directly from here, which is really great. So if you want to create your own connectors, you can absolutely do that. And people will then have the ability to kind of view them, use them in flows, use them in apps. And the best part as well is that if you've got on-premise information, so you've got data on your actual physical um, machines, you can use the on-premises gateway to get access to the data as well. So we're basically trying to give you guys the ability to connect to anything you'd like, absolutely anything. The last one, which is probably my personal favorite, um, is we've got this thing called AI Builder. Now, you're going to laugh. I, I often equate AI Builder a bit like to a horror movie. And now you're going, what is he talking about? But let me explain. So... I'm pretty sure some of you have watched a horror movie and, and, you know, there's the classic scene where the person walks into a house and the door randomly opens. And as they go and the door closes, it's like, and you're like, oh my gosh, that's free. That freaks me out. And it often scares people because they're like, wow, the door just randomly slammed shut. But actually it's relevant to AI because folks, I hate to break it to you. Doors open and close. That's what they do, right? The thing that makes you afraid is you do not understand why that happened. And it's the same with artificial intelligence. A lot of the time, it's not consumable. It's not easily consumable. So you think that you have to be a coder, and you also think that maybe Arnold Schwarzenegger or uh, Keanu Reeves is going to bust through the door and start blasting out Terminators or the mate, you know, those Matrix Matrix robots. And that's not what it is. It's not about fear. So what we decided to do was we decided to democratize it and expose it directly within the Power Platform. We wanted to give you all the ability to actually view it and see it in a way that was easily consumable by you. So instead of you thinking that there's a ton of code that you have to write, you just have the ability to quite easily interact with it. So that's why we built AI Builder. You can do some incredible things. You know, the, the one, one of our favorite ones is you've got the object detection functionality. And I'd be happy to do a demo offline for you. But the object detection one, you basically scan in a bunch of images. So you train the model to understand what an image looks like. And then you can include that, that object detector in your applications. So if you're working in, um, I don't know, let's say insurance, and you need to take photos of uh, you know, certain things on cars, you can actually teach the model to understand where there's damage and where there's not. Another one that's really cool is we've got the, uh, text, the text recognition. So... If you, you can quickly like scan a form in, it even recognizes handwriting, believe it or not. It would never recognize mine. I often say I should have been a doctor, but then, you know, I think people's lives would be at risk. But yeah, it picks up actual handwriting itself, which is incredible. But the best part is that everything under the hood is done in Azure. So the cognitive services that it's using are built in Azure. Nothing complicated. The only thing is you just don't have to do all the weird techie stuff. You can just consume the models in whatever rate or way you'd like. So... To summarize, I think um, there's a couple of important things here, but one of the important things is number one, this does not work without data. Okay. So today you're going to learn how to build a very basic data set using a SharePoint list, but that list is going to be the lifeblood of what happens with your app. Okay. The, the most important thing is data. So I always say, you know, breathe life into data. The data piece is going to be very key and core. You can do some wonderful things with um, the Power Platform leveraging data, you know, with all sorts of things like, um, you know, the, the uh, sorry, mixed reality functionality. We saw during one of the hackathons recently, some, some a team built an app that measured space and allowed and gave people instructions on how to build a pop-up hospital for COVID. That is bonkers, right? 
but it's all about data, folks. The second thing is, is that you want to make your apps consumable. Now, I'm gonna I'm not gonna lie, the apps that I build aren't that good looking. It's not because I have no talent, it's mostly because I have no taste. So I'm not I'm not a, I'm not a visual per I am a visual person, but I'm not very good at creating apps that are that are pleasing to the eye. Whereas Steve is a, an absolute legend at it. And um, you'll see in the app you're going to build today, but I'm not really good at that visual piece. So I need someone like Steve that understands that visual elements of it and knows how to build them. So today I would encourage you to just experiment a little bit, like obviously follow the instructions, but also try to kind of break out into your own style, figure out figure out what works for you. You know, you're going to make it you're going to make it pleasing to the eye. Apps that look awesome are adopted very quickly. OK, and then the last thing I want to say is that, you know, anyone can do this if you want to. There's the capacity and capability and potential for anyone to build an app. But what I would say is that you need to learn and take this opportunity to learn. What you do today is the tip of the iceberg. There is so much more under the hood. There's so much more opportunity for you. And as I said, you know, you've seen a video of Summit. People change their careers because of this. It is a huge opportunity and the power platform space in Microsoft is probably it's it's one of the biggest and it's receiving huge amounts of investment. So I just encourage you to really, really start, you know, diving into the different app types. Just experiment. The best way to do this is get hands on. So with that, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to start yet stop yakking. I've gone I've gone for 35 minutes and I hopefully you guys have gotten something out of this. But I'm going to hand back over to Steve and uh, Steve is going to show you actually give you a presentation of this epic app he's built. I'm going to claim zero credit for this, right? He has built this amazing app that's going to talk to you a little bit about um, how you're feeling at home. It's going to help you share information. And uh, yeah, you guys are going to build that. You're going to build your first app for some of you. So um, Steve, I'd like to hand back over to you. Thanks, Chris. Um, that was a great overview. Hope everyone found that useful. So I'm just going to share my screen and basically just give you a little demo of the app you're going to be building and uh, a little bit about what's involved. And then after that, we'll hand back to Chris and you'll be sort of start building the app essentially. So hopefully you'll be able to see my window. Okay, I'll tell you when it comes up. OK, can you see that now? Yeah, I've got it on my end. Brilliant. So the app itself, just to give you a little overview of what it does, obviously with what's going on in the world at the moment, um, a lot of things have changed. A lot of people are working from home, perhaps feeling a bit isolated. So we wanted to build an app we could use within our business to essentially just check in on people. So it's essentially a daily survey. So every day at nine o'clock um, we use a Power Automate workflow to send an email to everyone in the team just saying, please go and fill in this survey, click the link and it brings up the app. And so the app you see on screen, it's four questions. So how did yesterday go? How are you feeling about today? I know what's expected today and how you feel connected to your team or manager with a sort of comments box. So there's a little bit of logic built into the app. So you can see at the moment the submit button's greyed out. So if a user sends a reply where the score is six or less for any of these questions, it enforces that you have to put a comment in before you can submit the form. And what that'll do is once you've submitted it, it will then email your manager just to say, this person doesn't seem too happy. Can you just check in on them and make sure they're OK? Um, likewise, if you, so if I change all these to 10 now, you'll see the submit button becomes active. So because everything's higher than a six now, I don't need to leave a comment, but I optionally still can. And if I do choose to leave a comment, it will send my manager a slightly different email just saying, Steve's left a comment today, this is what he's put. So it's less urgent, he probably doesn't need to contact me, it's just more for information. So as you can see, these sliders are just one to 10 for each one. It'll show you the score you put in as you go up and down. So that's really it. So the app, it's just two screens, this first question screen. And if I then just pop these up to 10, just type in a comment, I'll just put test for now. If I submit that, there's just a second screen, which will load in a second. So what this is now doing, that's logging my response to the form, which is stored in the SharePoint list, which I'll show you in a second. Um, plug my internet's just a little bit slow because I'm presenting at the moment, so there we go. So this is just a little screen they'll get once they've submitted it. So there's a bit of logic on the app as well, just to check that people only submit one response a day. So if somebody goes into the app after they've responded, they'll get this screen and then the next day when they come back, they'll be able to submit another response. 
So the data itself is stored in two lists. So we've got a user list. So this is where you basically say who you want to fill out the questionnaire each day and who will get the email each day asking them to fill it out. It shows you when the survey was last requested, when they last completed one and how many working days. So one other element we have in this is we have what we call a flow, sort of workflow, so Power Automate. And that will run at four o'clock every day. And if anyone hasn't filled in the form for a couple of days, it'll again send an email to the manager just to say this person hasn't checked in for a couple of days. Do you want to just make sure they're OK? So that's automated. Um, again, it's just a way of checking in on people to make sure they're OK, dealing with isolation all right on their own. And then this second SharePoint list. So again, both of these will be creating as part of building the app. It'll be the first steps in building. And this just logs everyone's responses. Now, we usually set these to be sort of private. So if anyone does come into SharePoint, they can only see their own responses. Um, but it's up to you how you want to handle that. Um, we've also, internally, it's not covered today, but we have built a little Power BI report. So it's Chris mentioned Power BI is part of the Power Platform, and that just gives us a little report that the sort of senior management here can go and check in just to see the responses in general, just see charts to see what the average score is each day, how happy people are. So if that's something you're interested in, there'll be some contact details at the end. You can drop us an email and we can just sort of run you through that. Um, yes, yeah, so that's the app really. As I say, there is a Power Automate, so a couple of these. So this is something you'll be building part of the app, just step by step instructions. Um, so don't worry, it perhaps looks a bit scarier than it is, but it's quite simple to put together. And this is just what triggers the emails each day. So to here, there's just the step that sends an email and it's on a scheduler to run at nine o'clock every day. And um, we've put a little bit of code in there just to make sure it only does it on work days. Unfortunately, it's not smart enough to do bank holidays and take into account people's holidays. So you, they will still send on those, but it will skip weekends. So you're not being asked to fill in on typical days when you're not at work. So as far as the app goes, let's say Chris mentioned if you want to have a play. So we've included in the zip file, which hopefully you've all downloaded. If you haven't, it's on the Q&A section here. There's a link to it. So that's got the instructions in there. It's got this background image and this title image. If you want to use your own images, if you've got your own sort of branding, obviously have a play. You can do that sort of stuff. You can swap those out when you get to those steps in the guide. So yeah, I hope the app's useful, something you might be able to use. And um, on that, I'll sort of hand you back to Chris, who's going to sort of build the app along with you and we'll get cracking. Cool. Thanks, Chris. No worries. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to steal the screen share. Right, and let's just get back into Give it a sec. Yeah, I can see yours now, Chris. Is it coming? Great. Okay, so can you see the uh, Microsoft Tech Community guest blogging instructions, the Word documents? Yeah, I've got the Word document on the screen. Okay, and is it live? Okay. Oh, yeah, it's live panel on the right, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, my team says it's a uh, it's loading a preview. <laughs> Let's give it another crack. Looks okay. Uh, could somebody on the call just on um? In the audience, please confirm that you can see the uh, the word documents. If you just wouldn't mind publishing a quick comment. A bit shy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Somebody be okay just on the Q&A section here, just pop in a quick comment, just see if you can see the Word document that's on Chris's screen at the moment. Okay, great, cool. All right, so it's got to this line. Thank you. Fair, okay, so what, uh, what, what, 
what my good friend Steve has done and taken the time to do is a uh, sorry, I need to open the right document. <laughs> that's normally a, that's normally a good place to start. Let's just get back into um, there we go. Right, so what our good friend Steve has taken the time to do is um, run through the entire app build process and build you guys a lovely document of how to actually build out the solution. Now, don't worry, it seems like a lot of pages. Uh, it's actually not. So the time that we've got to do this is we've got roughly two hours to build out this app. Now, you're gonna think I'm crazy, but you can do this in probably less if you know where to click and what to do, but you guys may not have any experience with the Power Platform. So um, <laughs> somebody just told me to do my updates. <laughs> so uh, you, basically the whole idea is that you can you can run through the whole documents and uh, you go and go through it step by step. Now, the way that it's structured is that when you run through the doc, there's going to be certain areas you're going to kind of start off at 1.1 you're going to be 1.1 you're going to go through the whole process of generating the sharepoint lists you're going to go through the process of adding various fields to the list i'm not going to run you guys through the entire documents but ultimately the idea is is that when you get to the app build you kind of go ahead and just uh, connect up to the data sources and then add in the relevant things for the app that steve showed you so you should end up with a fit with a pretty good looking app actually but that uses um that uses the actual data directly from the SharePoint lists. What's also really cool is that right at the end, you're gonna have the ability, as Steve showed you, to do a little sorry, sort of in the middle, you're gonna have the ability to do the error checking. So you will need to do some little some very basic error checking. But as you go, there is a section on building the UI out, which is probably the most fun part. So as you're building out the UI out, you can um you can add in the various uh, you can add in images if you want. You can use the ones that uh, Steve has provided you with, which I would use because they look really awesome. Or you can use your own. So you can experiment with other other types of images or other types of imagery. If I was you, I'd also try and step out the lines a little bit and change uh you know change some of the fonts. Just get used to it. It's very much like using PowerPoint, and I'm, I'll I'll do my level best to build it with you. But as you go. The last piece is going to be you're going to be building out what we call a flow that Steve showed you right at the end. So the flow is basically the thing that's going to schedule stuff. Now, one of the things that Steve has very kindly done for you is he's built out all of what we call the expressions for you. All you need to do is copy paste. OK, literally. So all you've got to do is copy paste directly into the um, into the relevance, into the relevant areas of the flow, as well as the app. When you see stuff that looks crazy, it looks like gobbledygook, okay? That's a little bit of code. Don't worry, just literally copy paste it. That's it. All you're gonna do is copy out of the document and paste it into the expression box. It should, it won't break. I tested it yesterday, I ran through everything. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start building the app out live. I'm probably not gonna do too much commentary because if I talk at you for two hours, somebody is going to beat me or leave me rude comments in the, in the chat. So what I'll do is um, I'll start building the app out. I'm not going to go super fast. You're more than welcome to follow. But uh, ultimately, what you'll end up with is a application that you can kind of touch, feel, squeeze, cuddle, whatever you'd like. The other thing is that if you have a question, OK, all you have to do is leave us a message in the live Q&A and we can go back and do stuff in front of you. So for everyone on the call, there are, quite, there are a few of you on the call, um, just please be patient. So if there is a question, what we'll probably do is just shoot back, rerun part of it or redo part of the demo. And um, yeah, you know, that, that should answer any anything that, that you guys have. So what I'd suggest you do before you build, go and get yourselves a cup of tea, go and get watered, do whatever you need to do, come back and uh, let's start building that app. So uh, Steve, how does that sound to you? Yeah, that all sounds great. So as Chris said, um, you can hear if you go on the publish section of Q&A, anyone who joined late as well, there's a link there to download the document with the instructions and the images. So just in case you haven't got that, that's on there. 
and yeah so hopefully enjoy it and i say we'll be monitoring if you've got any questions and there will be a q a at the end so after the two hours we've got an hour we may not need that long depending on how many questions come through but um any just general power platform questions that kind of thing we'll address at the end um i'll see if you've got any questions whilst you're building the app just pop them on there as well and we'll try and answer those as we go so cool so let's say at 10 past 10 roughly i'm going to start building stuff okay Cool. So call a little break and then we'll come back and build some stuff. Sure. See you in roughly 10 minutes.
Right, I am back. Steve, can you hear me loud and clear? Yeah, it's coming through nice and clear. Can you even see my camera? Yes. And um, it's screen share as well, so it looks like I think we're good to go. It's rock and roll. Yeah, so I'm, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna talk everyone through it. So everyone on the call, um, please feel free to stick a comment in. Uh, let us know when you've started, and well, let, let us know if you've got any problems. Number one, number two, uh, let us know if you've started and if you're getting ready to and, and if you're building. We'd love to know, and also send us like crazy comments or anything in, in the chat, and also. Please feel free to tweet about this. Um, so if you want to tweet, the hashtag I used is um, how are you doing at home? Uh, there we go. I took a horrible selfie, so you're more than welcome to do. There we go. Nice. And then the, you need to be following underscore there you go so those are the two things you use if you use a tweet and if you tweet i'll make a plan to retweet and share the share share, uh, share your amazingness okay so app build time steve are you ready yeah so just say to everyone as well i mean if you do get to the point where you think you're running out of time don't panic obviously you've got the instructions so you can carry on with this after the session if you don't quite manage to get it all done so don't panic rush in and there'll be some contact details at the end so if you have any follow-up questions or anything like that you'll be able to give us a shout yeah yeah absolutely absolutely all right so i'm going to start up with uh, so i've got your i'm pretty lucky i've got my um i've got i've got three screens Right, so I've got your instructions living here. Well, bam, and I've got everything living over there. Ah, bro. Yeah, so, Steve, what did, you, what did you guys select um, SharePoint as a data source for this? What was that, sorry? What made you guys select SharePoint as a data source for this? Um, well, we picked SharePoint because the data structure itself is fairly simple, so you know, it didn't need to be anything too complicated. And obviously, it's included as standard as part of the Microsoft 365 license. There's no additional costs, so we just wanted to create a simple app, and we wanted to share it with customers without them necessarily needing any costs. So I think Paul mentioned earlier we have been giving this app away free as something we'll set up for customers as well um, to use. And obviously, it makes it a little bit easier for something like this as well. Um, but yeah, it's just nice and easy to set up with SharePoint. It's easy to connect up to the Power App. So it just did the job. So we didn't see any point overcomplicating it by using something like, you say, the common data service for this one, because it's that was probably a little bit overkill for something like this. There's only a handful yeah. of fields. Definitely a good choice, my friend. I've done the same. By the way, instructions are awesome. Oh, cool. No, I'm glad it made sense. <laughs> Lots of screenshotting and uh, yeah, not good. <laughs> I mean, I tried to sort of work through as I was doing it, obviously, as well. So, yeah, so I had a good idea, but it's always reassuring if somebody else has a go at doing it, just to make sure that following it through all works correctly and makes sense and everything. So, hopefully, it will for everyone else taking part here. I do hope so too. I'm sure it will. The one thing I found is that um, it's kind of like, you know it's just very linear so you just got to kind of run through it bit by bit yeah i mean i tried to make it step by step as possible and include screenshots for as much of it as i can because i know doing these things with experience myself when you haven't got screenshots you're not always 100 percent sure where to click and that kind of thing so hopefully that would just make it a bit more obvious of where everything is and if you're clicking in the right areas and that kind of stuff well I actually it reminded me a little bit of doing app in a day actually you said this one was easier. <laughs> I'm purposely going slow, by the way, so that I don't. Actually, I'm not purposely going slow. I am just slow. <laughs> you know what? I actually, I actually got to say. So, I, I historically have not been the most complimentary of um, flat data structures, but I would say SharePoint's not bad, hey? It's actually a really good way to build out applications and not not screw with data too much. Yeah, I mean, 
when we very very first started looking at power apps as well i mean the first introduction i had to it at the beginning was in sharepoint if you've got a list you've got a button in there where you can click power apps and it would generate a simple app for you based on that list and that was quite a good learning exercise in a way is it lets you go into the app and look at the code it's generated for you and get an idea how it works and then obviously build on that from there to creating stuff more like this it's a bit more custom and built sort of from scratch but um, yeah anyone who hasn't used it before and that kind of thing just want to have a play with it that's quite a good way of getting a simple app put together just create a list in SharePoint have it generate an app for you and um, using the power apps button which I'll briefly show you at the end of the session if you haven't seen it but um, it's um, yeah, it'll give you a nice form with a standard sort of layout that you can share with people. Um, yeah, so it's quite good. Yeah, and that's 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 the pro of using this versus the common data service. I mean, because you don't, you only really need to understand how the list works. You don't need to understand the relational piece. That's it. I mean, on this one, there's obviously a couple of lists, but the functionality it's reasonably separated out so we've got the user list just for mostly for the flows for sending the emails out so it just knows who to email each day and track when they've last filled the form in and then obviously the actual responses themselves but, um. yeah as a as somebody that historically used common data service all the time it's a little it's quite it makes this um it makes this a little bit easier for when you want to do these types of applications because yeah the common data service can often be a little bit too heavy hitting for this type of solution so we've got a few comments coming in on the questions let's just have a quick look so started building pretty straightforward up till now no selfie for me no one needs that okay uh, I'm sure I'd love to see it. So, so we are, are we are we going to publish these out? I think we should, so everyone can see it. Yeah, yeah. So let's publish that top one. So just starting the second list from Alistair SharePoint. Should I select? So let's have a look. Just starting this SharePoint. Should I select a team or communication site to add the list to? So I mean. <laughs> team site I think either is fine really I think both sites support lists so whichever really um yeah this one's a team site that we used uh, 1.9 can you get something wrong any ideas so let me just bring up the document myself as well just so I can see that step yeah yeah so is it oh you know so it's um when the title field when you're changing the title field uh keep on getting something wrong that's really weird so over here, you just got to click the title and then switch out from require this column contains information from yes to no and then hit OK. Yeah, so that title field should already be there. It's a standard one. It's not one of the ones you've created. So where you've got a little list of fields on the list settings screen, you just need to click on the one that says title and that'll give you the settings. And then from there, you can change that. So yeah, yeah. just this is now on the screen. So title comes with it. You get you get a title with every SharePoint list, don't you? Yeah, that's right. It's usually required by default. Um, you can sometimes repurpose it, just rename it and things like that. But it's one of those fields. I mean, you tend to find when you go in to edit data, the link to edit the data is always next to the title field. So you ideally need to keep it visible on the list itself, but you don't necessarily have to use it or put data into it. And so. Steve, you can officially tell everyone on Twitter I was making apps on SharePoint lists today. <laughs> I think this is the finest form of multitasking I've done in several years. <laughs> so it's definitely handy having a few screens doing this kind of stuff, isn't it? I always struggle if you only have one a little bit. So. Yeah, I've learned now we do um we do so many hackathons. <laughs> it's kinda like, it's super useful to have. Yeah, definitely. I just to to see what people are posting.
you know, old me would have been putting on some greatest 80s rock music right now. <laughs> Change that. <laughs> it's like my go-to. It's my go-to app build hackathon music. Nice. Any particular favorite songs? Or? Man, it's all it's all Guns N' Roses. Nice. I'm crew. Although some people could argue, argue Guns N' Roses was 90s. Both in there, I think. Semantics, my friend. But they said I missed out on seeing them. They played at Download I think last year or the year before at a festival right near where our office is. So that would have been nice. But Oh, you guys are re- located right there, aren't you? Yeah, literally about 10 minutes away, probably, sort of driving. I'm going to come, come, come visit you on the next Download mission. That's it. <laughs> Hopefully we'll be a bit more back to normal by the next one, and I think obviously this year's got cancelled and everything. But. Yeah, it's quite sad actually. Had a little bit of a cry. Yes. Let's see how everyone's doing. No new questions yet, so I think everyone's beavering away with it. Yeah, I might I might add in a couple of funky little backgrounds and things just because why not? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do like the background you guys have though. Yeah, I mean we're quite happy we've got a good um, design team now. We could put all the sort of imagery and that together. So I, think I can't take too much credit for that. Um, I'm I'm definitely a huge, huge fan of the panda bear. Yeah, that's it. There are new sort of marketing tools that's done some quite popular. So probably should have tried to get a panda in the app somewhere really. <laughs> Real quick. Um, There we go. There's the red up teams culture stuff. Super, super cool. Oh, yeah. yeah, your branding team is amazing. Yeah, they do some amazing work. It's on the videos and stuff they put together as well. It's uh, so I'm similar to you. I'm not particularly amazing with design and that kind of thing, more on the techie side. So, but yeah, they do awesome stuff. Yeah. There's a little panda hanging out there. <laughs> yeah, if you guys want to check out um, the Red Hot Teams Culture stuff that Cooper Perry have done, it's definitely worth a look. Yeah, so I'll grab a link actually and post it on. But I mean, there's some links uh, at the very end. There's going to be a little questionnaire if people don't mind filling that in. There's also going to be a few links to things like this kind of stuff, which we'll show at the Q&A at the end as well. But we'll post a few links on the Q&A here as well, if anyone wants to have a look. Sorry, there was me getting distracted with pretty things. See, even, even on a live call, man, I still have to look. <laughs> I see. Okay, so I'm I'm diving into building out the actual app now. How's everyone getting on? Sort of following along with the app? Any problems, or is it all making sense so far? By the way, I've got like the most giant man mug, but I, I do lose man cards because I've got green tea in here. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Yeah, I've had a quite strong coffee this morning and then was on the water at the moment. What I've found is that the moment I get onto strong coffee, nobody wants to be my friend anymore. <laughs> to get a little bit hyperactive or. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I've got to get the ear. Do, 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 do. 
Hopefully got the right one. Looks right. Cool. Amazing. More questions. Let's have a look. Yes. Yeah. I think went on the change the syntax as much well on the first list. Working day since the last form field. I'm just pasting from the documents. So I mean, it sh should work as is on that one. Um, yeah. Key thing is making sure the field names you created match exactly to the ones in the documents. So if there's any differences, obviously it's referencing those fields to do that calculation. Um, I think Chris yeah, is just going to bring that up. So it'll be the, I think on the user field, it's no, sorry, user list. Sorry, wrong field. Uh, yes, the calculated reference last form field. So the calculated one, yeah. Uh, there we go. Yeah, so what I found is that you've also you've got to make sure that everything matches 100%. So you'll see in the calculation, um, they have to literally just look, they have to be exactly the same. Yeah, so it references the fields like last requested form and last completed form. So it's important they're the same. Uh, so when you've named them and created those fields, it's not exactly as per the document. I mean, in terms of the app itself, I mean, this is used for the workflow that we can create to um, email if somebody hasn't filled it in for two days. So it's not key for the app itself, it's more for the workflow at the end. So worst case, if you're struggling with this bit, it's not crucial for developing the Power App and getting people to fill in the form. It's just if you want the two day trigger where somebody hasn't responded for a couple of days. Um, but yeah, it should work fine. Say so key bits, just make sure those fields are named exactly the same. Just double check James, when you've pasted it, you haven't got any extra sort of characters or anything in there and that kind of stuff. Yeah, James also made a good point. He said, to those getting something made wrong, I also found it took a few minutes for the other fields to be acknowledged before I could reference them with the calculation. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, it could be SharePoint itself just waiting for them to pick up those fields then. Okay, so I'm just publishing stuff out. Sorry, I hope you guys don't mind. Yeah, I'm getting rid of something went wrong. Blah, 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 content syntax here. Okay, cool. It's the same. So, I guess, yeah, you just got to make sure the fields match. I can't think of anything other than maybe just to wait, make sure the fields match, and you said they are matching. So, cool. Um, but also, maybe give it a minute or so. Or um, add, add, get those fields added, add everything else, then refresh the page, and then try and um, try and add that that calculation in again. That might be your best bet. So give that a crack. Give it maybe a couple of like maybe two minutes, and then let's let's dive back in there and take a look. Yeah, I'll leave it open on my side. So yeah, some people are whizzing through, so I was just on yeah. the yeah. So for those of you that finish this in like an hour, my challenge would be to do some extra stuff. So add in some extra bits and then try and send screenshots over or something like that. And um, then you can make our look, um, our work look even worse. <laughs> no, mine especially, uh, my design skills are not great. That's it. Um, I mean, things like the confirmation screen, especially you might want to sort of jazz that up a little bit more. So at the moment, it's just a label with a message on there, perhaps put to, yeah, some images on there, some logo, perhaps some extra information, that kind of thing if you want to. Um, so you can even have a go, I suppose, add in if you've got any thoughts on extra questions or if you want to vary the question slightly, that kind of thing. Um, so you just need to create some extra fields potentially on SharePoint and pull those in if you feel like trying that. 
There's a few ideas do, that you could do. Uh, I do also have a, a challenge for anyone. So if you if you if you get stuff done really quickly as well, uh, there is something cool that you can do. Give me a sec. I'm going to show you something. Sorry, Steve. Now I'm like going into Chris mode. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a tool called Canva. It's a third. It's not a Microsoft tool, but it helps design um, app UI. So I use Canva to do to design the um, a lot of the the user interfaces for the apps that I build. Now it's my wife's account as well. Just saying. <laughs> so we're not going to go into like anything weird, but um, if I go to all your designs, so here's some of the stuff that we've done for for some of the apps. So I built a um, membership management app design using this. There's a whole load of stuff you can do. Yeah, so this is a really great way. If you use Canvas, you put them together. Um, you can make them look basically exactly like the. Let's use the this one over here. So if I go make copy, that's a super cool way to design your app templates. Okay, like I said, I have no text, right? So it's probably going to look horrendous. So I'm going to call this. Um, you get all these cool little elements that you can drop in. So uh, delete that dude there. Um, drop in. Let's put in a picture of a badger. For no good. Oh, that, that guy looks that's called a little raccoon, right? So you can design whatever you'd like. You can make it look really cool. Then you download it. Now, here's the cool part. You can either download it as a um, as a GIF or a PNG. And Power Apps supports GIFs, which is super cool. So when you create your Power App, you can actually use a GIF as the opening screen. And the example I'm going to give you is um, let's close this guy up real quick. The example I'm going to give you is let me go into make.powerapps.com. I built this app for UFO sighting. Now that's because that's a normal thing to build, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if I go to UFO and I run my UFO sightings app, this looks super cool on mobile. So when you open it up on mobile and you show it to people, people are like, oh my gosh, you've created this great UI. Okay, it does take the first shot. Yeah, the first time it loads, it takes a second. Mostly because my Wi-Fi is like crawling slow. Yeah. Okay, but once you've got that done, my little space invader at the bottom, there you go. So this opens up as you're running your app, right? So every single time you open your app, you get this repeat animation. And then what I did was I embedded Power BI in the background uh, on one of the, sorry, I, I left the animation running in the background on one of the forms and embedded Power BI reports. So like I said, this is absolutely no relevance to anyone, but um, the, the app that's running here tells you where most of the UFO sightings are. Big surprise. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a silly little example, but you can make stuff look really good. Now, I mean, making stuff look Cooper Perry good is hard because they have like a whole design team, but you can you can make you can get your own little branding going, which is quite cool. OK, I detract. <laughs> Um, Just checking so Scamanti, have you um, did you manage to get that calculated field working in the end, or are you still having issues? Worst comes to worst, we can always Steve um, maybe create a private screen share using we we'll need your email address though. But if we create a private private screen share, we can run through it. Yeah, sounds good. Cool. Okay, still having issues. Um, so I mean, yes, Commander, you can either sort of skip that step and let's like say it'll just be the flow at the end, or if you want to drop us your email address, we can try and do a little screen share and have a look at um, what's on your screen, see if we can sort of figure out what's not working. Do you want to skip that step? What I probably recommend is um, just delete that field, create it as just a normal number field, and that way, perhaps, we'll still see it there. 
as a same type of field and everything, it just won't auto calculate the number. Yeah, that's a good idea. It's a little workaround. Be a good old workaround. Yeah. You sometimes do them in chemiceps. Oh, what am I doing? I love this new error checking. It's actually super cool. And Chris, what's the best way to start a screen share? I've got the email address. Um, I'm just trying to yeah. do it. Just not find it. I don't need to do it as an actual meeting request. You have to do a separate. Yeah, you're gonna have to create a separate meeting. So go and mute on this one. Um, create a separate meeting and then do the screen share there. And then I'll man the guns here. Okay, I'll be back in two minutes. So yes, Command, you should get a meeting request through in a second to the email address. And um, once you accepted that, we'll just join like a normal Teams meeting, then we'll get to share your screen and have a look. Just don't forget to go and mute here, otherwise it's gonna get weird. Yeah, that's it. So <laughs> oh, you put a lot, now you just got me. Steve's run away. <laughs> Folks, 
please do not forget to save your work, whatever you do. That's like one of the most important things. It will make you very sad if you lose a whole app. Well, it makes me very sad. Right, so um, I can see it, hashtag. Uh, you got a question. I've opened the Power Apps and 2.10 does not tell you. I can't find the form section in the menu bar. No problem. Looks like a little bit of a typo. So if you go to your Power Apps, go to the menu bar, click on screen, you go to insert, you'll see forms at the top over there. So I'm just sharing my screen. So you're gonna wanna chuck in the edit form over there. So remember, hit screen one, click on forms, and then you should uh, click on insert and then forms. So I'm gonna put that in the response. So Hope that helps. And next one is I found it. Never mind. <laughs> I need to stop reading the next question. Also, the guy will publish that. But for anyone else that was watching, that's a problem. Okay, so Alice just brought up the point, said, okay, I've got to save the test app. 
but it didn't jump to a no item dis to display page. So backtracking. So um, what what I reckon what what I reckon's happened, man, is that in the button on your select, you need to add in submit form and then form one. I'm just taking a guess here. Uh, and what will happen is that when you run it, all right. Whoops. Let's just make this edit mode again. There you go. So when you select it over there, when that submit form happens, just keep an eye on, just keep an eye on the top of the screen. There are these little animations that will happen. So when you hit submit, if you've got that submit form in, in the on select, you'll see that, there we go, that'll happen. So sometimes you'll have this little, uh, there's a little animation that happens at the top of the screen here. So that would, that would be my, my best guess. Now what's cool, whoops, I'm on, not on me. So what, what's cool right now, so you'll see that um, later on in the in the app build, 
you're going to get to copy different things and it's it's literally like using powerpoint right so you can literally copy screens if you really want to so if you build something and you want to like copy it or add in add in different things you just copy paste right and you can change the themes and all sorts of things which is quite cool so i use the copy paste functionality literally all day One thing I will say is when they ask you to delete components from the one screen, just make sure you are on the right screen. So there's part of the part of the course where it's going to say remove the copy the screen, move for the form, remove the button. Just make sure you click on screen one underscore one. So what I did when I was testing it, but um, I didn't realize I was on the wrong screen, so I deleted from the wrong one. Can I tell you something cool? You've got a thing called Control Z. So if you make a mistake in building your app, Control Z will get you out of the problem. So it's very much like using PowerPoint. So once again, you just go Control Z if you've made a mistake, and it'll um, it'll save you. It's a very useful little trick to know. Again, back again. Um, yeah, it was a strange one. We didn't manage to get to the bottom of it. Um, it's yeah, everything looks spot on, on there. So um, for now, we just set it to always be two on that field. And uh, oh, that's pretty. That's fine. I mean, it's not the end of the world. Yeah, I mean, everything looked fine on the list. Uh, the only thing I'm wondering is if possibly it's a slightly older version of SharePoint. Maybe the syntax is slightly different on the formula or something like that. But it seemed to think somebody else was editing the list when they're clearly not, but uh, <laughs> the message was coming up. So, but uh, yeah, I've got to, at least we can sort of carry on with the rest of the build in the meantime. Um, excellent, excellent, excellent. One or two little, little issues, but nothing too much, nothing too big so far. Oh, well. Alistair, did that, um, did, that, did that solution solve the problem? Which is that say? No, so um, I was having an issue when um when saving the uh, when saving the form on the test app, it wasn't coming to no item to display page. So I figured it could be the form submit form. Wow, by the way, I spelled submit form in the query wrong. So it should be submit form form one. One thing um, I will mention on this as well, I notice that when you run the app, it will work the first time when you submit it, but then when you go back to it, it sort of hides the questions. When you use the app outside of the run button within the editor, it's absolutely fine, but for some reason when you run it within the editor to test it, it only seems to sort of work the first time until you submit it. Um, I'll try to reset in the form mode and that kind of thing. I'm not sure if that's just a glitch with the way the run command works in here or... Yeah, so if you want to if you want to get rid of that, um, so if I go ahead and I run this, you'll see that the form is blank. That's it. Yeah, that's what I was so, so watch this. If you just select the form out again, just change it to um, change it to edit mode as edit, and then switch it out to default new again. It should work. Ah, uh, bro. Now it's just a quick little fix. Just, just, <laughs> yeah, power platform. Power platform knows the state of the form so once you've saved it once because it thinks this because we haven't reset the form after the save which is fine because you don't really want to do that in test um yeah it'll it'll do that so ah, okay Brilliant. cool my app's getting there getting there slowly <laughs> Uh, just in case anyone is whizzing ahead and is onto the first flow part yet, yeah, one thing I'll mention a little, I think it's a little glitch in the flow editors. When you get to the part of creating the email, there's a part where you um, use a link button to put a link into the email. 
and I found numerous times when you put that link in and click OK, it'll add it. But then when you click out of the email, the link disappears. So the first time I ran it, it sent an email without the link included. So it's worth just clicking out of the email editor part and just clicking back in and make sure your link is still showing. Um, I think it's a little bit of a glitch in the flow editor. Um, it seems to sort of do it a couple of times on, I think on my third attempt, it kept the link and it worked. Um, but that's just something to bear in mind. Um, annoying Alistair. Um, Spot saving theme for. Oh man, your form vanished. Weird. Excuse me.
uh, Steve, Alistair may need a screen session. Uh, say it fast, screen share session. Got form issues.
Okay, so we've got another question. <clears throat> the question is, when editing the slider, the minimum and maximum value, the first default number was okay to change, but the rest are grayed out. Um, so what you've got to do is you've got to make sure you right click on it and you say unlock. So not just on the card, but you actually have to physically, so I'm sharing my screen up now, by the way. So you physically, got, that's the card, you've got to click onto the slider, right click and you'll say unlock, right? So sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, uh, components on a form are locked. So you have to physically unlock them. So just make sure that when you click on the actual form itself, sorry, the data card, you need to unlock it from there. That's very, very important. If you don't do that, you won't be able to edit the, you won't be able to edit any of the attributes within there. Uh, I can see it. Hashtag. I hope that uh, I hope that made sense. So if you unlock the box already and it's still the same, that's interesting. <coughs> Excuse me. There's no reason that it shouldn't work. Right, what I'll do is
So we've got about half an hour left of the build time, everyone, and um, sort of check in, see how everyone's getting on. Um, Steve, did you manage to help Alison? Uh, yes, so I think we got to the bottom of this saving uh, issue. We've got a small issue where this slide is only two of them are saving the values uh, and the other two are just coming through SharePoint blank at the moment. So it's just going to crack on with the rest of it and we'll revisit that afterwards just so we get a bit conscious we're running low on time on the build. Yeah, but uh, yeah, it's just a submit was for some reason, yeah, missing a couple of the questions. Ooh.
Cool. Looks like you're getting through it there, Chris. Yeah, I'm, I'm done. Nice. How's everyone else getting on? We've got about just over 20 minutes left on the build time. Is uh, everyone getting through it okay? Cool, yeah, that looks good. But one thing just worth mentioning on this, if people are testing it as they go, um, if your AD is up to date with your manager, just bear in mind, if you're putting comments and things, it may get emailed through to manager <laughs> as you're doing this. Um, so it might be worth just warning them, they might get the odd email and that kind of thing if you're testing. That's very true. Has anyone else um, finished the app at this point, or is everyone still working through at the moment?
Okay, guys, just coming up to about 15 minutes left. Um, if anyone's got any last questions or anything while we're going through the build, it's a good time now. Um, we'll see we'll follow up as well during the Q&A section, so you can ask questions about this or the Power Platform in general during that.
All righty, so uh, we've got a question from S. And um, it says, when testing my app, clicking the submit button does nothing. Coming back to the form, I get a uh, warning triangle above the form submit button saying delegation warning. The filter part of the formula might not be working correctly on large data sets. OK, so you guys can see my screen. That's not that's not a problem, right? If you go ahead and you go edit in the formula bar, you're going to get to that huge block of code. OK, don't worry too much about that. So basically what that means is in the app checker, if you go to formulas, basically the school of thought behind this is that if you've got huge data sets with, um, you know, large amounts of record, basically and we have a limit of 500 records on the data sets. Um, the you can change the limits, but basically it says that because it only extracts X amount of records at a time, you're only filtering that set of records. So ultimately what's happening here is that it's just warning you of that. We don't have that many records. We're not even remotely close to it, so you're good. Um, that's what that little yellow warning triangle at the top is. So it does warn you about large, large data sets. OK. Um, and the issue is, is that when clicking the submit button, it does nothing. The only thing that I would think of is that you must make sure that you put that block of code, if you guys can see my screen, that that expression that's been written, so it's like an Excel expression, you need to make sure it's in the on select of the submit button. Okay, so sometimes what people do is they'll put it on something like the display mode or something. You must make sure it's on select and that code is dropped in there. There are other things that could be an issue as well, like if you've got your um, your comments box, the name of this comments box over here is data card value six. If you go into the expression and you have a look, I'm just going to click back on submit. You need to make sure that where it says uh, data card value, where it says um, data card value five or four, it must say data card value six. And there's three of those in there. OK, so just scroll down very slowly. Just make sure that that says and data card value six. There's one over there, data card value six. And there's another one over there, data card value six. That's that's really, really key. So that's another reason why it might not be working. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the only thing I can think of off the top of my head is in terms of visual changes, the main thing will be the submit form bit at the end and the navigate. So the navigate is what takes you to the confirmation screen. So if you've missed adding that little line of code in at the very end, yeah. so it should say navigate screen, we'll probably say navigate screen one underscore one in brackets. Yeah. Um, so if you haven't got that, it won't take you to the confirmation screen after you submit the form. So it's worth just checking that. Spot on.
Okay, we just hit 12 o'clock, so coming towards the end of the build time. Um, is there anyone who's just in the middle of finishing any bits in a couple more minutes um, before we sort of crack on with the next parts of this year? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be keen to know if anyone managed to finish. Yeah, if your post just gives an idea of where you got to, uh, how you found it, that kind of thing, that'd be great. It's on the Q&A section. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't realise I was not on mute. I wasn't on mute and sipping water. <laughs> it, it could be, might not be water. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, a big shout out to all of you. Well done for pushing through. We didn't give you loads of time, so uh, good job. Yeah, thanks for everyone attending as well. Um, I know I obviously a chunk out of your morning, um, but hopefully you found it all useful and it's given you some ideas of how you can start to use some of this stuff. And I think nobody's come back asking for more time, so should we crack on with the yeah. next bit? So I was just going to do a quick screen share, just show you how to share the app with users. Obviously, once you've built it, you probably want to push it out within your business. So just a very quick overview of how you can do that and share it with other people. Um, so I think if I just share my screen, I'll just pinch that back. So let me just get the right one. So can everyone see my screen? Hopefully it should have the app on it at the moment. So I've got it, but um, have, you sent, have you sent it to live? Uh, yeah, it should be showing on the live event for mine. Could everyone somebody just post a quick message? Just let me know if you can see my screen. There should be a SharePoint list on the screen at the moment. Oh, James. Um, so while while we're figuring that out, I'm just going to publish James's question. Yeah. James, your error, James, your error is the only thing I couldn't finish was the email. I had an Office 365 manager failed issue. Um, yeah. So that that issue that I had means that you need to assign a manager to your user in Act, Azure Active Directory. It's literally like a two second job. But obviously, if you're doing this on your internal environment, it ain't going to work because you don't want to break like your hierarchical settings, but all you literally do is go to um, portal.azure.com, pop in there. It's literally a four click exercise to add that that user and the manager will then once it sees the manager, that email will work, right? So um, yeah, it's normal question. I had the same thing. I just fired the manager and then it worked fine for me. So that's the only issue. Yeah. So well done. Nice work, man. That's it. Um, one thing to bear in mind, I, mean, I think it does mention it in the very beginning of the document as well, is when you start to push this app out to users, if you do decide to roll it out in your business, you just need to make sure that the users you're pushing it out to have also got their managers set in the same way. Um, so that's how it knows who to email if you know, they do leave a low score and that kind of thing. Um, the only thing just add briefly to what Chris just said as well is if you've got an on-premise um, active directory that syncs with your Azure AD, I think you have to set the manager on your on-prem AD in the normal way and then it'll sync up to the Azure AD. Uh, it won't let you set it on Azure if you've got the syncing set up. So it's just one of two places you might need to set it depending on your sort of company's setup for AD. Cool. So we've got confirmation that uh, we can see your screen. Yeah, brilliant. So in terms of sharing this app, so for standard Power Apps, you just share it within the Power App itself. For this one, it's slightly different just because you've got these SharePoint lists. So the first thing you need to do is anyone who you want to fill out this form on a daily basis, you need to go to your SharePoint users list you created at the beginning and just add a row in there for each person. So if you've only got a few people, the quickest way you can just type in the names here. So if I just pick somebody random from here and what I would normally do is whatever day you're looking to roll this out for the initial first day of the survey is just set the last completed form to the previous day's date. So if we were doing it today, we'd set this to the second. 
Um, apologies for the lag, it's just I think we're presenting my internet a little bit slow. So we've set the last completed form to yesterday and the last requested form to today as this will get updated when the email goes out. You can click save. It's just a case of adding in each person you want to receive the survey into this list. If you've got a lot of people, a quick way of doing it is you can use quick edit here and you can essentially I think, click on the username column here and paste in from Excel. So if you've got like an Excel list of people, you can set the values. You might want to hide the ID column on the view first and then just fill in these first three. So the last requested, last completed username, and then you can go in here and just paste that data straight in. So that's another way of doing it. Just might save a little bit of time if you've got a lot of users. And the other step you just need to make sure of is make sure that the users have got permission to add and edit the SharePoint list. So you just do that. You can either do it on your site settings or your list settings, depending on how you've got your SharePoint set up. Um, you probably want to give them contribute access on there. So you see here, if you go into the list settings, you've got permissions for this list. So in this case, it's inheriting the permissions from the SharePoint site itself, and it's this contribute group. Um, edits fine as well. And the only other thing I'd probably just do on here, and this is optional, but just in terms of making the data a bit more private, is on the actual how you do an own data list you created. Again, if you go into the list settings, there's a advanced setting where you can set it so people can only see their own responses. So if you go to list settings, advanced settings, and then here you can see at the moment it's set to read all items and create and edit all items. If you change that to create items and edit items created by the user and read items created by the user. So you only need to do this on the data list. That will just mean that if anyone does come onto the site and go into that list, they'll only see their own responses so you can keep it nice and confidential. Um, administrators are the exception to that, so they'll still be able to go in and see the full list. So obviously, if you're yourself, we've set this up, we'd expect to be able to see all the data. And then in terms of the app itself, so once you've got it all created, you go back to your main Power Apps screen. So if I just go to Power Apps. And you'll see the app in your list of apps. Just click on. So again, sorry about my slightly slow internet here. I'll just sign back in. So if you click on apps on the left here, once you're logged in, you should see the app you just created in your list of apps here. And what you can do is you can just select it here and then you've got a share button at the top. And then it's just a case of, again, just putting in the names or email addresses of people you want to share with. So you can just type them in, select them and then add one. Now it will send an email to them as you add them. You can untick that if you want to. And then once you've added people and you just click the share button at the bottom right. Um, again, if you've got a lot of people to share with, you can put everyone to share with the whole company if you want to in one go. Alternatively, if you've got an Excel list of email addresses, if you just make sure there's a semicolon after each person's email, you can just copy and paste that in in a big go. And it'll just take a few seconds to validate them all. And again, you can just click share. And that's pretty much it really in terms of sharing it. So once you've done that, people will be able to get into the app. So when they get the email, if you've got the flow running, they'll receive that email, they can click the link and it'll just take them into the app. If they install the Power Apps app on their phone as well from the App Store, so either the um, Play Store or the iOS App Store if you're on iPhone, um, once you log into that with their account, they'll see the app listed in there. So they can also use this on the phone if they want to as well or tablet. So that's a quick overview just on how to share the app. So hopefully that will make that pretty straightforward. So I'm just going to stop sharing my screen. So I'm just bring up the final slide for the Q&A. And um, we do have a little survey if possible. Great if you could fill in. So if I just bring that up. So it's really over to you guys. If you've got any questions at this point, really. Um, We'll go through and um, this QR code here. If you scan that on your phone, that'll take to a little feedback form. I'll also post a link to that just directly in the QA as well for anyone who hasn't got a QR scanner. And if you have got any questions, if you just post them on the QA as well, we can pick those up.
Yeah, really, really good interaction, everyone, by the way. Thank you very much for sending questions over and stuff. Um, we appreciate it. And we hope that you guys got some of your app working. So, um, so we're this on the questions. Um, Paul, I think, has rejoined us. Um, so while we're waiting to see if any questions appear, I'm not sure if you that, Paul. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so I think Paul we just want to have a quick just thank everyone for coming and just talk a little bit about some other bits and pieces you offer. So while we wait for any questions, you want to go ahead about Paul? That's yeah, fine. no problem at all. Thanks, Steve. So uh, I hope uh, hope everyone got uh, something out of the event today. And thanks again for, for Chris and Steve for running that. And uh, yeah, really appreciate it. It's great. So one thing I wanted to mention, obviously the the well-being aspect of the how you're doing at home app um, can be really useful. It's certainly been really useful for us internally at, at uh, getting those early signs of uh, where someone might be struggling. Um, so uh, we've certainly seen the benefit of that and it's, it's enabled us to support our people better. One of the things that we're working on at the moment and just developing is a new app, um, which we haven't necessarily got a name for it at, as such, but it's a check in, check out app. Um, what we're finding is as we are planning to return to the office um, in early July, if that uh, if that actually comes off, is that we can only have a limited amount of people in the office. So uh, based on that limited amount of people, we want to build a very simple app that allows people to uh, check into the office and check out of the office. So at any given point, um, if you were planning to say, you know what, I want to go into the office, but I appreciate, you know, we, we all have to be socially distanced still. Uh, I can I can quickly check before I set off and let's say there's 150 people, 150 seats in the office and there's 100 people in there. There's a good chance that actually, you know, I, I'll be able to get a seat when I turn up. As an extension to that, we're also looking at having a, a booking service so you can actually book, um, book a seat um, in that particular um, office space so uh, again it's uh, we're trying at the moment to just to respond to uh, the situation that we're in but also help our clients and the people out there um, with something that's functional and helpful so we'll make that available to everybody again it will be free of charge just as part of the support that we like to offer as part of uh, covid and you know where we like everybody else are just trying to respond in the best possible way with tools and support to help um, help ourselves and help our clients just navigate through what's a tricky time and, and yeah the next phase with returning back to the office now I appreciate that um, I think we'll ourselves you know we've deployed a, a work from anywhere forever policy so I think we'll all be working from home a little bit more moving forward I, I certainly will uh, I think you know historically I've been working from home probably one day a week and, and now it'll be more like three um, but uh, as we all transition into the office and we, we all want that a bit of human interaction hopefully that will be uh, a useful app so we'll, again as I say we'll make that available to you all so that's it from me I hope you really enjoyed it um, I hope it was useful if we can help in any way um, beyond this please do get in touch but uh, ultimately we, this was just here to help you so um, I hope you got what you needed from it and would appreciate any feedback in the form that uh, um, has been shared via that link and uh, Steve will share again onwards from here. Thanks again to Chris. I'll just leave it open just for a second in case there's any more questions to come in and uh, and then we'll we'll close this off. Thank you. Thanks Paul. Thanks Paul. Yeah big big shout out to you guys today. Thank you very much for arranging this and um, Steve for putting the app together. I think it's really great. Uh, thanks to you Chris as well for attending and helping in the um, session. Um, cool. So um i think so no questions have come through as of yet so we'll give a couple of minutes um see if anyone does but yeah i hope everyone who attended so first thanks for attending i hope you did find it useful um see so there's email addresses on the screen so if you've got any questions after the session that you want to do that you perhaps don't want to put on here feel free to drop us an email and um, say so if a few of you don't mind filling in the feedback forms so there's a link in the q a section or you can scan that qr code that'd be great and um, yeah and check out our website again i posted some links earlier so there's a few other bits on there might give you some ideas or some thoughts on how we can best help with things so yeah it'd be great if you could check that out as well awesome
doesn't look like we've got any more questions. So I think should we call that um, last orders and yep. put the session? Lost rounds. We're a little bell. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks everyone. Appreciate you attending. Thanks everyone. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Bye.